is 12.30, so I'm going to go ahead and get started. Um, welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Stephanie. This is, you get to see me for the first time if you haven't seen me earlier uh, during our opening session. Uh, I want to welcome you to Scaffolding an Open Textbook Project in an Undergraduate Core Curriculum Classroom um, by Jennifer Coronado at Butler University. Before this session starts, I have a statement to read on behalf of the conference. The Open Education Southern Symposium strives to offer an open, inclusive, and friendly environment for all participants. All attendees are expected to help maintain a professional and welcoming environment free of any type of harassment by being mindful of the space and time you're taking up, being aware of the dynamics of power and privilege, being considerate of others' desire for privacy, being respectful of others and accepting that differences in opinion and circumstances create a stronger collaborative environment and by actively challenging individual biases and assumptions. Jennifer, you may now begin and I will post a link to the full code of conduct in the chat. All right, well, thank you. And thank you everybody for joining. Um, so as Stephanie mentioned, this is scaffolding an open textbook project in an undergraduate core curriculum classroom. I know that's a bit of a tongue twister, um, but why don't we just go ahead and get started. So a little bit of background about um, who I am. I'm Jennifer, I'm a scholarly communications librarian at Butler University. We're a private liberal arts university in the heart of Indianapolis, Indiana. And we have about 5,000 full-time students enrolled. And so what kind of brought this project about was Butler hosts these faculty staff learning communities. There's usually, they're all volunteer based. So somebody volunteers their time to teach a learning community. And then members of the Butler community, whether it's faculty or staff, um, then sign up to join these communities. And it's a year long uh, learning community. And they're usually hosted, you know, about once or twice a month. And it's usually over a certain topic. And, you know, that group continually meets throughout the year going over over whatever the overarching learning community topic is. And so in the fall of 2019, myself and one of my associates, we hosted one of a faculty staff learning community. And it was designed around promoting and engaging more of our faculty in OER and open pedagogy. So it was essentially open textbooks. And it was a year long, um, community that we basically went through what are open textbooks, what is copyright, how do I find OERs, what if I'm interested in creating OERs, what are some platforms that I can, you know, engage more openly in, you know, with my students and things like that. And so, um, we had a faculty member who was very interested in using one of these platforms that we'll get into in a little bit in one of his core classes. And so at Butler University, we have a core curriculum, meaning there's a certain amount of um, classes that have different designations that every student has to take in order to graduate. And so, you know, those courses include um, they're structured by learning objectives rather than disciplines. Um, they employ experiential and interactive pedagogies. And so students are required to complete a variety of these courses um, throughout their um, throughout their college experience, regardless of you know, what their specific discipline is. And so I do want to point out on the slide, I've included and made the faculty staff learning community that we hosted. Um, I've made it available as an open Canvas course. And so if you're interested in later seeing what went into that learning community, you're welcome to follow that link. And you can kind of pick and choose what pieces of that Canvas course that we created that we, um, you're welcome to kind of, you know, remix anything in there that you'd like. So it's a little bit of background. And so the class that, um, so we had a faculty member who was very interested in kind of flipping his textbook that was for his, um, it's called first year seminar, FYS. And so he was very interested in flipping the textbook to an open textbook. And so he was an English professor, but he taught this first year seminar class. And so, you know, there's multiple different types of FYSs and it kind of all 
comes down to what that professor wants to teach and how they want to teach it. So this one followed a revolutionary Europe and colonial Africa um, topic. And so most of the students were freshmen. We'd have a sprinkling of sophomores, but typically, you know, we were they were all freshmen from various disciplines. And so the textbook itself retailed for about 120 new, or if students were able to find it for about 108 used. So it was still very expensive for a textbook that may not directly relate to you know their core discipline so you know it's kind of a pretty big burden especially if they have to take multiple different types of core classes that you know like i said it may not be a textbook they'd be wanting to keep as part of like you know their major so um he was very interested in taking some of the things that he you know we had discussed in this learning community and how can he apply it to his classroom and so we kind of discussed what some of his options are. One of them including was Scalar, which is a open textbook authoring platform um, out of USC. And so we wanted something that was an open source product. He wanted the ability to include very media rich, highly interactive content. So he wanted links, he wanted videos, he wanted pictures, he wanted you know, ways to include a lot more media than you could with a traditional textbook. He wanted readability online, so without any sort of purchasing, and he wanted it to be a collaborative project for his students. And he also wanted it to still include some of those traditional textbook elements. And so I'll preface this with saying that using Scalar in this project, it was for a semester long project. Um, we'll kind of get to it a little bit later with the pros and cons, but essentially, you know, using this and teaching it the you know scaffolding how to teach the students to use this product was very involved and so um, for a semester project it was a lot to ask of fresh of freshman students and we still feel like they you know rose to the occasion and they still did very well so we chose scalar like you said for that more collaborative feeling it almost kind of felt a little bit like you know a google doc but that was designed to kind of function a little bit more as a textbook so that's kind of one of the reasons that we chose it. And, you know, we had looked at other things like um, press books, but Butler was kind of limited in how we could share press books for students. So Scalar seemed to work pretty well with sharing it with a large amount of students. Uh, we had about 50, so about 25 for two sections that were working on the textbook. And so in terms of scaffolding it, um, when I got involved and really started to look at Scalar, it was a matter of this did have a little bit of a learning curve. So how can we kind of break it down so that the students understand what we're working on? And so the very first instruction session was understanding what copyright and creative commons are. Um, what is it? how do they find materials so that was entirely in its own instruction session which the sessions were about 75 minutes so i will say we had probably about six instruction sessions um, that were dedicated to learning the various things um, that i've outlined here but then there was also time for students to come with you know open office questions office hours they would come how do i upload this i'm trying to get this to be here so it wasn't just doing the instruction, but then it was also a level of troubleshooting too. So first thing was copyright, creative commons. Why, why do those things matter in an open textbook? The second thing was getting students added into the textbook because it required a little bit of students having to log themselves in and then I had to go and add them to the textbook. So I wanted to make sure everybody that was in our sessions was able to do this all in one go. So then our, our third session was actually learning Scalar the product. So how do I add text? How do I add media? How do I drop in links? Um, a lot of it, you know, didn't always require 
HTML, which was good, but there were times that we needed to add some CSS to it so that things appeared as they should. So that alone, 75 minutes may not have been enough. We probably could have done a longer instruction session on actually just using and learning the product itself. I had students set up in demo chapters so that each group could then you know, create sections within a chapter and things like that. So that really led nicely into the next session of organization of this information. So it was kind of learning more about how does a textbook textbook flow and work, you know, you can't just drop in a whole bunch of information. You need your introduction. Maybe you need to include some key terms, a glossary, things like that. You know, learning the flow and, and some of those elements you need to include in a textbook. And so we would then have dedicated time for writing and uploading contents to their various sections. So within the class, they were broken into probably about five to six groups of students. And so each student within a group was required to make their own sections. And then they were as a whole creating chapters. So they needed an introduction to their chapter. They needed a conclusion to their chapter. So students were required to write their own sections, but then have those textbook elements that you see in chapters. And then finally, we had time dedicated to linking those sections together within a chapter, but then also linking chapters together. Um, the nice thing about Scalar is that it allowed you to follow either a linear type base as you would with a traditional kind of print textbook, but then it also gives you the ability to kind of jump around to different chapters, which was really nice. Um, it also allows for a lot of tagging of different concepts. And so with those tags, you can kind of pull that information out and you can see where it appears in other sections. And so that was one of the other key reasons we chose Scalar was that it helped our students to kind of see that both this was a linear textbook, but it also had us the, the ability to kind of do a lot more visualization of their media and the things that they were writing and the terms that they were choosing. So we broke it out into probably about five um, formal instruction sessions. And then, like I said, there was a lot of time in between helping students uh, with troubleshooting, linking things together, kind of getting an understanding of how the product itself works. And so a little bit here as well, you know, when we talked about Creative Commons, we wanted to make sure that they understood that all the materials in the project had to be CC licensed. So that included a lot of, here's how to make an attribution, here's how you find various media. So, you know, that probably could have been two instruction sessions if you really wanted to. Um, like I said, adding students, you know, we had to add students to the textbook. Sometimes there were issues with adding their .edu email address um, for just whatever reason, you know, that's just sometimes the issues that come up with adding a large amount of students to a product like this. Um, like I said, basics of Scalar. So, uh, we really tried to break that into various smaller sessions. Um, we would do it as a group and then I would have them follow with me. And then I would have them as their own little groups add content themselves. And then we could see it appear on the larger screen so that we could see what was going wrong, what was working. Students were getting familiar with the product. We also went over, like you said, organization, how to make it feel like a textbook. and then with that we were linking those sections together and then multiple chapters were then getting linked together to create what felt like a traditional style textbook and so i'll take a couple minutes so we can look at this is our textbook um, the link itself is available in the slides for future reference it's just easier to already have it up but we had students write an introduction to the to the textbook um, we had them do full attributions. One thing I do like about Scalar is that we had both a description. You can see full details of things. Um, you can get more of a media file look at it over here. And then also you can see sources as well. So the one nice thing is that, you know, Scalar is 
very upfront and transparent about where things are found. So that was real critical when we were teaching students how to make those attributions, how to find this type of content. And so here, this is the table of contents. And so it kind of leads you into where we wanted those chapters to go. If students felt inclined to read it through linearly, they could do that. And then we also are given the option of a table of contents over here, and we can pull out what is contained within those sections. So, you know, there's a lot of information um, that allows you to kind of dive in and see what's available without having to click through the entire thing. And so we can see we've included, they have um, photos, We've included YouTube videos. And so here are the contents within this chapter and you can kind of go through it, click through it, or you can just click over to the next chapter, which was really nice. And so it allowed students to be able to kind of jump between various sections. And so this was, like I said, just one class. This was its first iteration. And so, we can see if we move through that, you know, most one student was typically responsible for a page or a section. So here we have fun facts, we have study questions that we wanted them to kind of still give it that feel of a traditional textbook. And so, so we had some student feedback that, you know, they really liked it, it was challenging. Um, like I said, because it's a new platform that students are learning, um, it, it did have a bit of a learning curve, but a lot of the students were very glad that they have something to show for it, the fact that there's something published out there as a freshman that they you know, can put on a resume or they can point to in their portfolio. So um, I was very proud of the professor that I worked with, that he was very eager to just jump into this type of an, you know, of an initiative. And so what worked, what didn't work? So what worked was that it was very collaborative. The students had to uh, write their information, write all their content, find images, find videos, put it together. There needed to be a level of peer review. Um, we had the students kind of peer review each other's chapters. Um, in the future, what we would have liked was to have the different sections peer review other chapters. Um, that way it wasn't just limited to the classroom, but it could be you know, across multiple classes doing peer review. Um, the students worked with CC licensed materials. So we're always trying to get students to be more involved with CC materials um, as freshmen. You know, we don't want them waiting till they're out of college and they're not sure how to find these various things, we try and get them to understand these concepts from a very early on perspective. Um, going forward, you know, we want future students to have the opportunity to both improve the content, add more content. Um, you know, some students did better than others. You, if you click through some of the chapters, you can kind of see some are, you know, much more media rich, much more content heavy than some. So it kind of just depends on how motivated a student was to get their various section done. And then one of the things that, you know, worked really well was that I, as the librarian, was pretty much embedded in the classroom and I attended most of the classes. So I was either in class when we were working on instruction sessions. I was available for office hours that I had quite a few students attend. Um, the professor dedicated class time in the library for students to work on things and would then coordinate so that if they had questions while they were working on things, they could come to my office and you know we could work through you know whatever kind of troubleshooting they were having. And so like I mentioned, it was a steep learning curve. So I don't know if I would recommend it 
you know, necessarily for a freshman classroom, but I think an upper level undergraduate class, especially if you can dedicate more than one semester to it, would be an excellent opportunity. Um, it was just a lot crammed into one semester because it was not just this textbook they were working on, but it was some other projects, other papers, they were assigned reading. So there was a lot to this project. And I don't think the professor quite realized you know, how much time really needed to be dedicated to learning the product and then making an actual publishable textbook. And then finally, you know, we were hit with the pandemic pretty much, um, you know, happened in March. And that's kind of when things were really gearing up on this project. So everything kind of flipped online, which, you know, still worked well. A lot of the students were still very, um, highly motivated to finish on a positive mark so you know we were very happy with the with the textbook that was turned in um so i think going forward we want to turn this also into kind of an improvement project so as a way to continually improve continually add to the content um, he still is going to require the students to read all the chapters but his plan going forward is to then assign a group to one chapter to either add add additional content, improve it, do peer review editing on it. So <clears throat> as a way to kind of keep it evolving, that's kind of the plan going forward. Um, as I had mentioned earlier, we wanted to spend more time on copyright and Creative Commons licensing, especially the attributions. That was probably our number one question was, I have this weird thing, how do I put an attribution together? So. I think definitely adding more time, more examples, doing more in-class exercises um, may be the key with that one. And then, like I had mentioned, the embedded librarian, you know, was probably essential to the success of this project, um, just because it gave the students another opportunity to ask questions. You know, I was kind of learning the program along with them. So being patient with both myself and with students, you know, it was kind of a back and forth. Um, so we were able to solve a lot of issues together. You know, we were both learning the product. So I think both just being there physically for them to see who I was, that I was kind of working with this, you know, alongside them was a little bit more reassuring. And then, you know, like I said, I attended most of their classes, both physically and then eventually set up virtual office hours. So I think pulling this project apart, helping them learn Creative Commons copyright first, get an understanding of the type of content you're going to, need to put into the textbook, but then also pulling apart how to understand this program and then understand what goes into textbooks really helped kind of give them that bigger picture in the beginning and then put those skills together to kind of make this textbook in the end. So I wanted to make sure I left enough time for uh, questions or comments. Yes, it looks like we have about three minutes left in the session. For, so if you have questions, feel free to throw them in the chat or in the Q&A. Uh, Jennifer, that was a fantastic presentation. Uh, so cool. I would actually, I'm not, I really love the fact that you were embedded in the instructor once you use it to like continuously improve their materials. That's fantastic. Yes, we, we took a break for this fall semester just because of the nature of everything. Um, he is hoping to get back with it this coming fall semester. So fall of 20, it took a break, which was totally fine because I don't think anybody had the bandwidth to really make it happen. Yeah. But I think fall, yeah. this fall, I think it's something that we can, you know, definitely get back into now. Yeah. Uh, so have you had interest from other faculty members yet about doing this? Actually, we did. It was all pre-pandemic, -pandem but I did have a um, another faculty member who was very interested in using it and wanted to, you know, how do I start integrating? And then, like you said, the, the pandemic happened and I don't think anybody had the bandwidth to learn another new product. So 
I know going forward for us as an institution, open is our new, like, not, I don't want to say new because it's always been there, but I think now we have the chance to be a little bit more aggressive with our faculty about it. Yeah. Whereas in the past, it'd be like, well, you know, we were a little bit more passive, but I think now we've, at least me, me, I feel like I've been given the green light to be much more like assertive, much more aggressive about it. You don't have to do it this way, but here are all these other ways. And this yeah, could yeah. be one for, you know, a faculty member who's interested in bringing students into that open environment. Fantastic. Well, I hope it, it comes to fruition um, and you get a second person in and you're just able to expand on this really cool project. Mm -hmm. um, we are at time, but I want to thank you, Jennifer, for a fantastic presentation. And thank you to all those who attended. Our next session is at 1 p.m. The webinar for this session is now ending. And I hope everyone had a great day. And feel free to reach out to Jennifer if you have any questions on her amazing work that she's been doing at Butler. Thank you.